Dr. Carson, when I saw you in Iowa, you said uh, you had been expecting some foreign affairs questions at the first debate, so I'll throw you some now. Uh, okay. <laughs> do, you, do you believe President Obama has complied with the corker Cardin law with regards to the Iran deal? Well, it sounds like they haven't gotten all the, uh, the documents uh, into the hands of, of all the legislators yet. Uh, but, you know, my biggest problem with the whole Iranian uh, situation is that I believe that the Congress should have never agreed to anything outside of a treaty. You know, it fits all the all the requirements for a treaty, and and of course he's bamboozled them because he knows that if it's a treaty, two thirds of the Senate have to okay it. And why are they continuing to let him play all of these games? What is your recommendation to them to simply declare that he's not in compliance and that people are risking violating the law or to break the filibuster, which is something that I'll be talking about with Senators McCain and Rubio and Graham later in the program. They actually have experience and they're all sitting in the Senate. What should they do? Well, um, I I think they've they've already played their hand now. I I think he's going to beat them. I don't think they're going to be able to to do anything legislatively now they, they they threw away their chance to make sure that it was a treaty and now that it's just an executive deal i don't i don't know that they have any anything that they can do if the, um, the, the good thing however is that it is not it's not binding the day that he leaves office since it's not a treaty you've anticipated my next question what does dr ben carson say he will do on his first day as president regarding the iranian deal uh, I think we uh, let the Iranians know that there's a new sheriff in town and that uh, we're not abiding by that. And we begin to use uh, whatever powers we have to uh, to slow down the process. But, you know, th- this is a longer-term problem because our allies right now don't have a whole lot of respect for us. And therefore, when we call for a boycott, they're probably going to say, you know, go go jump in the lake. Uh, we're going to have to very quickly get back to a point where people actually believe what we say, that our friends recognize that we're their friends and that our enemies recognize that we're their enemies. And there has to be consequences for being an enemy of the United States. Now, you've traveled extensively around the world, Dr. Carson. Has your reception changed over the years as America's standing in the world has changed when you go as, you know, the head of pediatric neuro- neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins? Was that different in the 90s than it was in the aughts and now that it's in the teens? Uh, well, n- not, not to me personally, uh, but because that, those were personal relationships. And, and, and in most cases, they needed something from me. <laughs> that, was, that was different. But, you know, our... Our standing in the world is very problematic, and, and it really puts American citizens in danger. Uh, it used to be that American citizens could pretty much go anywhere and, and not be worried because people knew that the full force of our military was behind them. But, you know, who's, who's afraid of us now? The total paper, paper tiger. What, would, what do you think is going to be the impact of $100 billion on General Soleimani and the Quds forces? Uh, well, it's not going to be good. <laughs> That's for sure. Um, you know, the the the, the Ayatollah has said, you know, very specifically that you know there's going to be a lot of money that's going to be made available, and I think that it can only be a bad thing for us. You know, all of the he, he's. You know, he's got relationships with, you know, many terrorist organizations. And it seems almost like we're facilitating the funding of those organizations. And it's very hard for me to understand how we can calmly sit by when the Iranians are actually calling for the destruction of Israel and you know, down with the USA, do, do we think that they're just blowing smoke? Yep, that is the question. 
Now, now, Dr. Car- uh, Carson, I want to ask you what I call commander-in-chief questions. Um, okay. Are you comfortable with the 3 a.m. phone call and your ability to handle it, whatever that might be? We are on the third anniversary of a 3 a.m. phone call at Benghazi uh, that went very, very badly for four Americans and for America's position in the world. Do you think you're ready to handle that kind of a crisis? Well, I think I could probably say with a great deal of confidence that I've had more 3 a.m. phone calls than anybody else is running. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and with lives on the line, and you have to make very quick and precise decisions. Uh, so, you know, do you want to get that 3 a.m. phone call? Of course you don't. But obviously you want to be prepared ahead of time. And in, in most cases... Uh, what I always did uh, in, in my department is we already sort of had pre-planned what to do because you, you kind of know what that 3 a.m. phone call is going to do. And I would do the same thing as commander-in-chief. You, you have a, a list of likely 3 a.m. phone calls, and you already have the situation pretty much defined in terms of what you're going to do. I know that there might be an occasional thing that might fall outside of that, but the vast majority of things are going to fall inside of that if you've gone ahead and prepared ahead of time. Now, the ultimate 3 a.m. question involves ultimate weapons, the nuclear weapons of the United States and those of our enemies and our allies. Have you become familiar yet, and it's still early, but have you spent time studying up on the structure of our nuclear deterrent yet, the triad? Um. I've certainly had a couple of conversations about it. I had a conversation about it two days ago. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I would emphasize extremely strongly, and it actually goes back to Ronald Reagan's uh, administration, uh, when he talked about, you know, the defense and Star Wars, and people thought that he was crazy. Um, I think that that is extremely pertinent right now. And I think that our failure to develop the right kinds of defensive weapons uh, puts us in a, in a very vulnerable situation. And our failure to control space puts us in a very vulnerable position. That the, we have to pay $77 million every time we want to send somebody you know, to the space station. The Chinese are just as active or more active with us with their satellite technology. Uh, they're going to be looking at manned uh, space flights uh, very shortly. They're going to be trying to control our exo-atmosphere. And I'm just afraid that unless we get on the stick here pretty soon, uh, that we're going to be denied access. And whoever controls our space is going to control what's going on here on the Earth. Well, part of the, the denial of access strategy that the Chinese are using in the South Asian Sea depends upon um, uh, asymmetric weaponry. And our biggest stick is the Ohio-class submarine. It's the Boomer. And they age out in the next decade, and they're phenomenally expensive to replace. Have you gotten into the into the tall grass yet? On I mean, If we replace the Ohio-class, it will take up the entire presently allocated naval shipbuilding budget. Uh, well, well that's, that's true, but here's where our advantage used to be. We used to be innovative. We don't necessarily have to follow the same paradigm that that we followed 20 years ago. And innovative technology in terms of our weaponry is what used to give us the advantage. We're not doing that anymore. Not to the extent that we should be. A good caution. Um, Part two of this, uh, Dr. Carson, I ask everyone if they've read The Looming Tower. I may have already asked you this yet because it's the sort of history of the rise of Al-Qaeda and radical Sunni Islam. Have you had a chance to read Lawrence Wright's? I've I've, I've read portions of it. And what do you think is the taproot of this burgeoning Islamist fundamentalism that we see most obviously in the form of ISIS, but it's around the world, but it's, it's causing 4 million Syrians to flee and a million Libyans to flee. What's the taproot? Well, I think the, the the biggest problem, you know, they've they've wanted to do this. They've wanted to, you know, d- develop their caliphate. They've wanted to spread their influence. They've wanted to dominate for a very long time. Why were they not able to do it? 
uh, until now, uh, I think there was substantial opposition, and they were afraid. But right now, what, what do they have to fear? We don't, we're not presenting any substantial uh, obstacle to them. And, you know, they now have developed their own caliphate. They have half of Iraq. They have a third of Syria. They have footholds in Tunisia and uh, Somalia and Nigeria. They're able to recruit people from all over the globe, including from our own country, and they look like winners. So what is there to stop them? We don't seem to be offering any resistance to what they're doing. Lindsey Graham has suggested 10,000 American troops deploy as part of a regional force. What do you think of that to combat ISIS? What do you think of that, and what about the complication of Russians being there now in our way? Well, uh, the Russians, I mean, if, if we let the Russians, the fact that they're going to be there, be our deterrent, then we're never going to get anything done. Uh, I think we, we do have to make a commitment. You know, a lot of people have become weary because they said in 2003 we made a big mistake when we went into Iraq, um, and we don't want to make that mistake again and lose troops and spend all that money. But the global jihadists are an ex- existential threat to us. And unless we recognize that and are willing to commit whatever is necessary, we will never develop the... Uh, the group of, of friends and allies that we need in order to maintain the peace there. We've got to get all the people, uh, you know, the, the whole Arabian Peninsula and everybody else involved in that area to commit troops and to understand that, that you know, it's really for their security uh, that we need to have ground forces. But we're not going to get ground forces there unless we lead. We're not, it's never going to form the coalition that the president thinks is magically going to appear one day.